Welcome to episode 647 of Aussie Tech Heads, recorded on 29th of August 2019. Aussie Tech Heads is brought to you by startnewcompany.com.au. Register your company fast, easy and direct with ASIC. All documentation provided and held in your account for downloading at any time. If you're an accountant or other professional, you're also able to brand all documents with your company name. Coming soon, ABN, TFN and Trusts. Special discounts available for ATH listeners. At the cart, use ATH20 for a $20 discount. And ATHwebhosting.com.au. Servers offer, operate on SSD drives, immediate activation, SSL certificates, Aussie support, domain registration, easy install of WordPress, Joomla, and Drew Powell. And we have back again Australia's top two podcasters. I'm your host, Jason Oakley, and I'm joined this week by Will Tompkinson. How's that for a change? But only just. Only just? <laughs> Tell us all about uh, it. <laughs> it's been one of those days that I'm just super tired. I don't know why. It's not like I had a big day. It's just my body's like, no, that's it. You're going to be tired tonight because I said so. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> we all have one of those. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> the coffee. Uh, coffee, coffee, coffee. Try, tried that. I think it made it worse. I oh. used up what energy I had left. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Me I was very disappointed <laughs> speaking of coffee in our um, Mr. T and I are on a new Minecraft server FTB, FTB Academy and I found a village in the desert and they had a coffee machine in there and I tried to steal it but it said oh apparently you don't have permission for this and it destroyed itself <laughs> so that happens with a lot of stuff in, in their village you just can't steal it because it just says oh apparently you didn't have permission for this it's gone I know, I've got the coffee. Where's my coffee? <laughs> you suck. Ah, so mm. you're yeah, doing yeah, that one. I'm good. playing. Um, I'm playing the new Die Wolf pack on another server. Yep. So you mean you just play, you play to... another server that's not mine? Oh, that's it. Yeah, and I play the Sky uh, Skybox server. I know. Surprise! <laughs> surprise. <laughs> Who would have thought I play Skybox server? Yeah, not me. <laughs> shocked, so, shocked. Yeah, and the problem is I log on from the the, the, the Diecraft one and the Academy one are relatively, Dolwolf, sorry, and Academy are relatively similar, but there's just enough differences that I have to be wary of which pack I'm playing. But, <laughs> like, it, it's got, like, a couple of things. Like, it's got turtles and a couple of things. So, like, I'm setting up my mining turtles at the moment. Oh, nice. So we didn't have them in um, no. Academy, is it? Academy. Darn. I nope. kind of like those guys. They're fun. They are fun. They'll probably find something <laughs> similar-ish enough. Some of them have, like, golems and stuff. They'll get there is a... Yeah, there is a wall miner thing that you've got to program somewhat. Welcome to this week in Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> we tried that, remember? Yes. <laughs> They didn't do anything for ages, and now they got parrots and underwater things. And... Yeah, there was no updates for the entire 18 months, two years we had the show, and then we stopped doing the show, and then they bring out more updates in Bastards. 12 months and they've ever bought out. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was, yeah, there's these Vindicator things and things that... Oh. If, is it 114 where if you're out at night too many nights in a row without going to bed, these things come from the sky and kill you? Somewhere, like yeah. Uh, it's, it's, now they got bees, so, uh, which we've had in FDB yep. for like two or three years. But yeah, that's getting time. ridiculous now. <laughs> oh well, I suppose we won't bore these people who are not interested in Minecraft with that and go on to some tech news. <laughs> yeah, I suppose before, before we fall asleep, anyway. <laughs> that's, it, that's it exactly. Doesn't help that somebody had to work tonight. Uh, yeah, bloody Will, what? No, we were blaming Glenn, Glenn had to do something tonight. That's the reason why we're even here. <laughs> Hi, Glenn. Uh, you know you sometimes watch the show. Big fan. He, he said I'm our number one fan, isn't he? It's just about. Yeah. <laughs> as long as somebody watches it. Somebody he just watches does. it to make sure we just don't upload like, the, the intro and just keep looping it for an hour. And he watches it with all them, all them YouTube bots that vote us up. So we're going to take on PewDiePie and stuff. Yeah, that's it. That's it. 
Inside a new microprocessor, the transistors, tiny electronic switches that collectively perform computations, are made with carbon nanotubes rather than silicon. By devising techniques to overcome the nanoscale defects that often undermine individual nanotube transistors, researchers have created the first computer chip that uses thousands of these switches to run programs. The prototype is not yet as speedy or small as commercial silicon devices, but carbon nanotube computer chips may give ultimately give rise to the new generation of faster, more energy efficient electronics. This is a very important milestone in development of this technology, says Quing Chow, a materials scientist at the University of Illinois in at the Urbana Champaign, not involved in the work. The heart of every transistor is a semiconductor component traditionally made of silicon, which can act either like electrical conductor or an insulator. The transistors on and off states, where current is flowing through the semiconductor or not, encode the ones and zeros of computer data. By building leaner, meaner silicon transistors, we get used we used to get exponential gains in computing every single year, says an electrical engineer at MIT, but now performance gains have started to level off. Silicon transistors can't get much smaller and more efficient than they already are. Because carbon nanotubes are almost atomically thin and ferry electricity so well, they make better semiconductors than silicon. In principle, carbon nanotube processors could run three times faster while consuming about one third of the energy of their silicon predecessors. But until now, carbon nanotubes have proved, proved too finicky to construct complex computing systems. With over 14,000 carbon nanotube transistors, the resulting microprocessor executed a simple program to write the message, Hello World, the first program that many newbie computer programmers learned to write. The newly minted carbon nanotube microprocessor isn't ready yet to unseat silicon chips as the mainstay of modern electronics. Each one is about a micrometer across compared with current silicon transistors that are tens of nanometers across. And each carbon nanotube transistor in this prototype can flip on and off about a million times each second, whereas silicon transistors can flicker billions of times per second. This puts these nanotube transistors on par with silicon components produced in the 1980s. But there's a possibility they may take over so, in the future. It could power my Commodore 64. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's kind of what I'm thinking. Like a carbon. Let's, in, let's invent this new technology that's slower than the old one. Yeah. <laughs> It'll unseat it one day. Just you wait. Oh, I mean, yeah, everything's, you know, every you new technology start starts off slow. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know carbon, they're, they're making uh, great crossroads in carbon nanotube um, for um, battery packs and for power density capacitors and stuff like that. So that's, that's um, they're a very efficient transfer of energy, so... You can store a lot more energy in this much smaller space, even even more dense than, than lithium and stuff like that. So I know they're they're doing that side of it, but I hadn't realised they're using it for um for processing power. Yeah. We shall see. Seems a pretty cool idea anyway. Um Yeah, I mean well theoretically it'd be, it should be cheaper to produce too by rights, because carbon would be cheaper to produce than silicon, but We'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of quick stories, just a heads up. Uh, under five months until Microsoft stops issuing free patches for Windows 7, uh, millions of PCs still relying on it, leaving them exposed to new bugs. Um, Microsoft has been nagging Windows 7 users to upgrade to Windows 10 for years. Uh, but a, a huge number of consumers and businesses. They either resist, have either resisted those calls or miss them. The systems will be easy targets for hackers after January 14, 2020. Microsoft stops providing free security updates after Windows 7. Um, according to a rush, according to a Kapersky, 47% of small and medium sized businesses are still running Windows 7, and 38% of consumers and 38% of small home offices are still on Windows 7. Uh, I know I am. Yeah. <laughs> I got most of my stuff on Windows 7. My media PC is running Windows XP. Yeah. Um, if you still if you run an aftermarket firewall and an aftermarket virus scanning, yeah, it's fine. So, um, larger enterprises can apply for extended support 
contracts after January 2020, but these will cost at least $25 per device per year. Um, so, see what happens there. And on the same uh, same note, Windows is warning admins to move PCs from Windows 10 to version uh, Windows 10 version 7.03 to for enterprise and education to a newer supported version. 7.03 for enterprise and education will reach end of life on October 9th. Uh, after which Microsoft will not deliver new monthly uh, security or quality updates uh, to this version of Windows 10. The company's warned that means the cut-off deadline, updates on notifications, um, as with earlier in the life versions of Windows, enterprise customers don't have the option to pay for extended support. Um, there's no extended support available for any edition of, Win of Windows 10 versions 1703, therefore will no longer be supported after October 9th. I will no longer receive monthly security and quality updates. Um, they released Windows 703, aka the Creators update, in early 2017, following the October release of 1607, the anniversary update. Coming to declared 703 ready for business in June. Originally offered 18 months of security fixes, however, Microsoft extended the service period to 30 months. Windows 10 version 703, Enterprise for Education Editions. So you have to upgrade to the uh, what is it? Eighteen oh nine, I believe, is the one, the new one. Yeah, I got it. I my desktop computer is always connected to the net, so it's always downloading updates <coughs> automatically and stuff for Windows ten. But a couple of days ago, I got a notice: this version of Windows needs to be updated. It's not going to be supported very soon. So please click here to update. And I was like. Why, why weren't you doing that already? I never stopped you. I mean, a lot of people do because they need to or want to, but I let mine update whenever it needs it. And for some reason, it was just like, well, you're behind, so update now. I was like, you should have already done it. Hurry up. <laughs> yeah, Windows 10 updates are horrendous. This laptop updates whenever it wants to. Two computers at work, just they say, oh, I need to restart to update, and you restart. I always still need to restart the updates. So restart. I always still need to restart the updates. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, Windows 10 is broken, which is part of the reason I don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Time I to go all problems. Linux in the house everywhere. Yeah, well, I'd love to, except there's a couple of programs I use that just won't work on it. Dang. So, but um, there's an interesting chart I'm looking at here. Um, yeah, Windows 7, if you look at the consumer market, Windows 7 is uh, 38%. Uh, Windows 10 obviously is 53%, but Windows 8 is 1%, Windows Vista is 0.3%, and Windows XP is still 2%. <laughs> so there's more people using XP than Windows 8. <laughs> <laughs> that says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, so, dear. But, um, yeah, so, I don't know. It's, I, I don't have a problem running outdated versions of Windows. It's, I, I don't use Microsoft security anyway, so... I yeah, you know how to secure your stuff anyway, so it's not like you're going to get hacked because of a flaw in Windows 7. No, I mean, I I, I use third-party firewall, third-party antivirus um, anyway, so I, I don't rely on the Windows one to, to maintain that for me. So it's like my system, uh, my main system, which uh, is broken at the moment, hence the reason I'm on my laptop with this dodgy mic and webcam, um, my main system is Windows Windows 7, and it's like Windows 7 Service Pack 1, because you need Service Pack 1 to do some stuff, um, and no other updates after that. I disable, after what Service Pack 1 goes on, I disable updates. Yep. So it's actually got no updates installed after, and it's so much faster. Like, it's nearly twice as fast. Ah, nice. <laughs> as the, the, the exact same system with all the updates installed is, yeah, half the speed of, of <laughs> the same of that system. It's ridiculous. That's terrible. No. French police, with the help from an antivirus firm, took control of a server that was used by cyber criminals to spread a worm program to mine cryptocurrency for more than 850,000 computers. Once in control of the server, the police remotely removed the malware from those computers. Antivirus firm Avast, which helped France's National Gendarmerie Cybercrime Centre, announced the operation on Wednesday. 
have asked said that they found that the command and control server, which was located in France, had a design flaw in its protocol that made it possible to remove the malware without making the victims execute any extra code. Cybersecurity firms such as Avast as well as Trend Micro had been tracking the worm called Ritadup since last spring. Most of the infected computers were used by malware authors to mine cryptocurrency Monero, but in some cases is also used to push ransomware and password stealing malware according to Avast. As the antivirus firm reported, most Ritadup victims were in South America with Peru, Venezuela, Bolivia and Mexico at the top of the list. Mm, what happens? People still want to crypto. <laughs> yeah. Nothing's and, happened uh, in crypto either, which is why we haven't done another crypto show, by the way. Except it's except been dead Australia, for two years. Yeah, Australia coins worth less and less now. Yeah, everything's going down. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, some, you know, <coughs> some stuff, if you've got an early enough, still worth money, but you know, a lot of it, if you, you know, it's not a good time to invest in anything at the moment. No. Unless you have a specific reason to do so, like there's a couple of sites I purchase stuff off, I need to purchase bitcoins to do it, or fractions of bitcoins to do it. Just don't so, get the Facebook Libra coin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? <sighs> yeah. So, um, Qantas and Virgin ban mm-hmm. MacBook Pros from checking luggage um, because everybody checks their MacBooks in, apparently, because. But if you own a MacBook, you're too posh to carry it on. I don't know. <laughs> but apparently, until further notice, all passengers are requested to bring their devices on the flights as carry-on. Um, they've confirmed all 15-inch MacBook Pros have been banned from checking luggage and must remain switched off during flights indefinitely. So even if you do use it as a carry-on, you can't use it sucked in. Oh. Um, oh. <laughs> um, following a recall, we'll notice by Apple, Virgin Australia spokesman said requested all passengers to take their Apple MacBooks and carry-on. <coughs> um, according to version Australia, the band follows the worldwide recall of 2015 15-inch MacBooks. Number of older generation 15-inch MacBook Pros, the batteries may overheat and pose a fire safety risk. Um, they may, but I would have assumed that if they're going to do it, they would have done it by now. It's been three years. If the battery packs were going to fail, they would have already done it. If there anybody knows anything about batteries, it's Will. It's not to say it's impossible, I guess, but man, batteries, after three years, life starts depleting in batteries. Um, but, you know, the thing is with like every other laptop in the world, you just take the battery out. If you, know, you don't want to run out on batteries, and when it's plugged in sitting on a power supply, you don't need the battery plugged in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, sucks to have a Mac, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, we just need a sledgehammer to open that up so we can get the battery out, thanks. Well, here's the thing. I went to post a phone. I had uh, an Android phone. I went to post um, to a friend because their phone died. I said, oh, you can have this one. Go to the post office and said, oh, have you taken the battery out? I went, no. I no, you've got to take the battery out. I said, but it, the battery, you know, yes, I can take this one out. But if it was an iPhone or whatever, I, I couldn't take the battery out. Samsung. <coughs> and they're like, oh, the newer ones, yeah, but the older yeah. ones you could. Yeah. Um, and, I'm like, and they're like, yeah, but the, under the freighting rules, if the battery can be removed, it must be. If the battery can't be removed, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> I'm like, they're the same freaking battery, whether you remove them or not. It's not going to make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> like, Let's just say it, this one doesn't come out. <laughs> It's actually safer inside the phone, protected by the plastic, than out of the phone, protected by a bit of thin paper. <laughs> like, who does on? Seriously. It's not the fact that it's plugged into the phone that's going to make it explode. No. It's going to do it regardless. So. And it's probably going to do it when you have a, a lithium polymer battery floating around loosely in a plastic bag. is more likely to explode than one in the phone. Right. It's bloody <laughs> ridiculous, mate. So it's like laptop batteries, like um, on the odd one we get that's faulty, we can't send them back because you can't, once something's classified as faulty, you can't send a lithium, a faulty lithium cell, you're not allowed to ship it. Can you put it in your test? So, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well you, there's things you can, there's things you can do with it, but you can't legally ship a faulty cell. So the funny thing is, knowing 
like a customer will send us a battery pack from a drill or something, knowing that there's a faulty cell in that to send it because it's why they're going to get repacked in the first place. But that's okay. But <laughs> we can't send back a faulty battery pack that's faulty from the factory. So they can send faulty stuff through the mail to you, but you can't send it Elton anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The the lords are so messed up. That makes so much sense. Hmm. To be, I wouldn't expect anything more or less from the the pen pushes in the little bureaucratic offices. That's that's, that's the whole. It's just it's getting ridiculous. It's like I need to justify existence. Let me contradict myself with another law today. <laughs> <coughs> Speaking of the um, cryptos before. The Australian man who claimed to have invented cryptocurrency Bitcoin has been ordered to hand over half of his alleged Bitcoin holdings, reported to be worth up to $5 billion. IT security consultant Craig Wright, 49, was sued by the estate of David Kleiman, a programmer who died in 2013, for a share of Wright's Bitcoin haul over the pair's involvement in the inception of the currency from 20, 2009 to 2013. Kleiman's estate agents allege... A state alleges Wright and Kleiman were partners, and therefore his family is entitled to a share of the Bitcoin that was mined by the pair in that time. Wright denies there was a partnership. A U.S. district court in Florida on Tuesday ruled that half of the Bitcoin mined and half of the intellectual property held by Wright from that time belongs to Kleiman. One issue it is is it's not known exactly how much Bitcoin Wright holds. It's been claimed that the Kleiman estate could get anywhere between 410000 and five. 100,000 Bitcoin, putting the value between 4.1 billion and 4.99 billion as of Wednesday. Wright claimed to the court that he couldn't access the Bitcoin because he doesn't have a list of the public addresses of that Bitcoin. He claimed in 2011, after seeing the cryptocurrency had begun to be associated with drug deals and human traffickers, he put the Bitcoin he mined in 2009-2010 into an encrypted file and into a blind trust. The encrypted key was divided into multiple key slices, and the key slices were given to Kleiman, who distributed them to people through the trust. So, well, let's begin for, for bragging. Mr. <laughs> Saka, what is it? Nagasaki Sakatomoto or something? <laughs> is actually some dude from Australia. Yeah. About that. Yeah, he kept his mouth shut. Nobody would ever know. Yeah. It could even be you. We don't know. You could be the <clears throat> Yeah, because I'd be sitting here doing this. <laughs> <laughs> because you love it so much. He really does love it, Glenn. Don't listen to his, his late night. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm delusional. <laughs> As if I, I'm either deluded or delusional. I'm not sure. Why not both? <laughs> it could be both. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that balance out, though? <laughs> I don't know. It's too complicated a thing for me to think about at this time of night. Eight people indicted for running two of the largest illegal streaming services. Uh. Eight individuals have been charged with an indictment by the United States for allegedly running two of the largest unauthorized streaming services. Federal grand jury that gave an indictment alleges that two streaming services, Jetflix and I Stream It All, caused copyright owners to lose millions of dollars. Because here we go. Both services were used by tens of thousands of subscribers and could be accessed online on numerous systems, including smartphones, tablets, TVs, video games, consoles, digital media players, set-top boxes, and web browsers. Jetflix allegedly obtained infringing programs from Pirate Bay, or from pirate websites such as Pirate Bay, um, by using... I love the fact, like, they're avoiding... They're, they're minima, mitigating how much homework you have to do here. Jetflix allegedly obtained infringing television program from pirate websites such as the Pirate Bay, RARBG, and Torrance. <laughs> <laughs> so there's three sites you can go and get some. <laughs> Just in case By you didn't automatic... know already. Yeah, I know. By using automatic computer scripts and then we provide pirate content. I say it lets you use many of the same automated tools as Jetflix but to, uh, to locate, download, process, and store the content, but also provided movies and visual television shows. Uh, two services obviously reproduce tens of thousands of copyrighted television episodes and movies without authorization. The Justice Department said it distributed infringing programs to tens of thousands of paid subscribers throughout the US and Canada. At one point, Jeff Fix claims to have had more than 183,000 different television episodes. 
The two services allegedly offered more television programs and movies than legitimate services such as Netflix, Hulu, Vudu, and Amazon Prime. Sounds like where we should have signed up. So, doesn't that seem like that's your problem? Yes. (laughs) If you have a legitimate service and you're not offering as much as a service who's paying half as much for and getting twice as the amount, could that potentially be the problem? Yes, let's split (laughs) it up now into Disney Plus, which we're going to have to subscribe to to watch Marvel and stuff now. So, basically, according to the indictment, Jetflix was allegedly run by Christopher Lee Dahlman, da- Daryl Julius Polo, also known as Crimp... Crimp... What? <laughs> if you put an also known as, make it a real word, <laughs> also known as DJPPD... So, I don't even know. Douglas Corson, Felipe Garcia, Jared... Jared Edward, these can't be real names. Jared Edward Jack Jackery Jr. <laughs> Peter H. Herber. You Uni Valiant You U any Valiant. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he in Roger Wonder Rabbit? You any Valiant for for, for and Louis Angel Verino. None of these are real names, people. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Pirates with fake names? Whatever next. <laughs> so outside countries like US and Australia have ramped up their efforts to curb the legal distribution of copyrighted content, hence the increase in VPNs. Uh, over the past 30 <laughs> months, there's been a stream of legal battles in Australia with privacy content, uh, which is another reason you go to Aussie broadband because they don't monitor your internet. <laughs> um... But, uh, yeah, so basically, I use uh, movies.do um, for all my stuff. Pretty good. So, but, yeah, here's, um, uh, it's just, it's just getting ridiculous. So the this whole system's going to have to just collapse soon and, and start again because they can't get falling back on this, on this thing, um, uh, this whole lost income thing. That, that's and just... exclusive deals so that you have to subscribe to 10 services to get all the stuff you want. And geo blocking. Yeah. But if you don't allow me to watch a show on your service where I'm willing to pay for it and watch it, then of course I'm going to get it somewhere else. Yeah. But, but it has, and this is the thing, you can't then go and bitch because I've eaten into your income. You're the one who didn't allow me to watch it in the first place. So don't I wanted to when... give you money. Yeah, I was quite happily going to give you money. Then you suddenly decided that you don't want my money anymore. Um, so when I when that money I now either don't give to somebody else or I don't um, uh, like. You I would think at least at, at least us being in that you know what do they call it the five countries that monitor people and all that sort of stuff have got this agreement to surveil each other and. Yeah. You think Australia is there, America's there, England's there. Why don't we all just let each other... If you want to geo-block, do some other countries. Yeah. Why does Australia miss oh, out? That's, that's the thing. Like, we love America. We follow you into wars and shit that we don't give a damn about. And I mean, Actually, BBC is the worst in. at it. The, the, England, England's worse than America at geo blocking. Everything comes out of England's geo block. It's, it's horrendous. Yeah. Um, but then you go to other things like Motor Trend on Demand was a YouTube startup. They had um, Roadkill and they had, you know, the Hot Rod Magazine, all that stuff. They were on YouTube. Then they decided that they could make more money by having their own Motor Trend on, Motor Trend on Demand and having subscription services and stuff like that. Okay, fine. But they geo-blocked it to the States only. So they went from an international platform where everybody could watch their content and everybody got seen the ads and everybody made the money to a lockdown streaming content where they could only show it in the States because it's geo-blocked everywhere else. But they don't give you an option to watch it for free anywhere else. (laughs) So the several million subscribers that you had and you've now pissed off because they can't watch the content not only can they not watch it for free, they have to pay for it, but half the people can't even have the option of paying for it. You just can't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, Isn't this supposed to be like a global economy thing happening? 
Mm. Didn't that happen sometime? Maybe I blinked. Yeah, that was when the Euro came into existence. That was a good idea. Oh, now they're trying to get out of it. Point. Yeah, well, that was the point of the Euro. So that we had an, uh, an international trading platform. That was why it was brought about, that everybody would be paying the same amount based on their on their conversion currency to the euro, and theoretically it balanced out so everybody ended up paying the same amount, which would work fine if anybody actually used the euro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep pegging that US. So, yeah, well, that's it. Well, this is the thing, like, it is about every transaction, because we import a lot of stock from China and, and whatever, and... Our major supplier, thankfully, now allows us to pay directly in whatever Chinese dollars are. Um, but we can pay them directly in that now. We don't have to go via US and then trans and back across. Um, Conversion fees because, are killer. Well, not only that, it worked out dear. Like, if we're paying the Chinese against America and the Australian against America and we're paying in US dollars, we ended up paying more than if we just paid directly to the Chinese. Yep. <coughs> so we can pay directly to the Chinese currency and it actually costs us less for exactly the same end result. Ah. So they get paid the same and we pay less because we're not going to a higher paid currency to a lower paid currency. Win-win. Mm, so... But most of them don't. Not ninety-five percent of our suppliers only accept US dollars. Ah, so for years, Microsoft used its patents as a way to profit from open-source products. The poster child for Microsoft's intellectual property aggression were the file allocation table patents (FAT). But Microsoft of then is not the Microsoft of now. First, Microsoft open sourced its entire patent portfolio, and now Microsoft is explicitly making its last remaining fat intellectual property, the X fat patents, available to Linux and open source via the Open Invention Network, OIN. Microsoft announced that it now loves Linux, and we say that a lot and we mean it. Today we're pleased to announce that Microsoft is supporting the addition of Microsoft's XFAT extended file allocation table technology to the Linux kernel. XFAT is based on FAT, one of the first floppy disk file systems. Over time FAT became Microsoft's file system of choice for MS-DOS and Windows. It would become the default file system for many applications. Microsoft extended FAT to flash memory storage devices such as USB drives and SD cards in 2006 with XFAT. While FAT isn't commonly used today, XFAT is used in hundreds of millions of storage devices. Indeed, XFAT is the, tip the official file system for SD Card Association standard large capacity SD cards. Now, Microsoft states, it's important to us that the Linux community can make use of XFAT included in the Linux kernel with confidence. To this end, we'll be making Microsoft's technical specification for XFAT publicly available to facilitate the development of conformant interoperable implementations. We also support the eventual inclusion of a Linux kernel with XFAT support in future revision of the Open Invention Network's Linux system definition, where, once accepted, the code will benefit from the defensive pattern commitments of OIN's 3040-plus members and licensees. Specifically, according to a Microsoft representative, Microsoft is supporting the addition of the XFAT file system to the Linux kernel and the eventual inclusion of a Linux kernel with XFAT support in a future revision of the Open Invention Network's Linux, Linux system definition. Well, that's going to be great. Didn't, but hasn't that always been the standard? Like, you can format something in FAT and both Linux and Mac and Windows have always been able to read it? Yeah, but not XFAT. You have to have uh, add-on modules for your kernel. Uh, okay, so it's only Now it's going to be all built into it, yep. Yeah. So it's basically the whole MP3 thing again. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> others can use it too. We're going to share our ball with you guys. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what it is. Like, it's literally like, you know, we'll let you look at it and we'll let you play with it, but you can't actually touch it. And you, you, know? yeah. <laughs> you can't take <clears throat> it home with you. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Um. I mean, yeah, I get. Well, I guess, <laughs> I guess technically, and this is how I never really understood it because isn't Windows based on 
Linux. And Standards, yeah, but the fat table that, came from Microsoft. Yeah, but isn't anything that's based on Linux supposed to be kept open source? Implementations, yeah, I think so, but um, they use the standards, but I don't think the actual code, so the code needs to be open source, but if you're just using your code based on their standards, I don't think it needed to be, depending on the license. Yeah, I yeah. No, no. Yeah. MAB Android app updates, uh, the new update, overload your CPU and drains your battery. Okay. Um, yeah, Bank Directs uses to use the browser-based um, browser based um, blogging instead uh, to acknowledge issues with an update. Um, the bank's Play Store has been swamped with star, one-star reviews since the update. And I uh, saw so it's understood the issues affect most of Samsung devices running Android version 9. They say our tech team is currently investigating the issue, which means they're not doing anything about it, though. <laughs> Um, you could you could uninstall the app and use the web browser plugin for now. Most users found app chewing through large amounts of data, and even when it's not happy, um, it shows the app is having been used for 15 minutes actively today, but running in the background for seven and a half hours using 40 percent of my battery. Well, uh, I get six hours out of a full charge now, so 25. What's going on? 32.8 percent of my battery's usage is this app. 48 percent drain of my battery and CPU overload on Samsung S8. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so basically, yeah. If you have the mobile um, NAB mobile banking app, you probably want to be uninstalling that. <laughs> yeah, don't just not use it. Get rid of it altogether. <laughs> so yeah, there's that. And um, Bunnings um, has cemented the position as Australia's standard hybrid digital retailer. Whatever. Revealing the additional cost of rapid online sales rollout across 374 stores will be as low as the annual cost of a mid-level full-time employee per store. Hardware Giant's full-year numbers have finally shed some light on massive digital expansion, which started to go live across stores in time for Christmas this year, with dev costs recorded at a super skinny $30 million over two years, covering 2019-2020. Operating costs are approximately $10 million associated with development of digital offer were incurred in the second half of total approximately twenty million expected to be incurred in the twenty twenty financial year. Um, so it works out to about forty thousand dollars per year per bunning store. Uh, over and above West Farmers undisclosed tech investment rolled up what a figure to eight hundred and sixty million for twenty nineteen. So yeah, that's not gonna take them long to make that money back with their online sales. Hmm. Do you go to Bunnings so, much? No choice. There's nothing else or any. Why is it like that my, at I least half like the time the self-service checkouts have a big chain across them? You know that? You not to use, it's, it's one of the few stores I actually prefer you not to use them because it's uh, so easy to flog stuff. Yeah. It's so easy to pinch stuff from me. I, I prefer if you go to a normal checkout um, and let them screw it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... But yeah, like I have to use, but I've got a local hardware store here in Rosewood, but um, they open the same hours I work. So yeah, uh, they're good. Yeah, yeah we just go to Bunnings much. too. And they're not. I mean, I'm not a fan, and they are a dearer way of doing it. But they're becoming the only way. There's there's Bunnings and there's minor tens, and there's more Bunnings than anything else now. Yeah, they've taken so, it. So as much as I don't like them. Um, what so we get to that point where you don't have much of a choice anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd, I'd much prefer to go to a local hardware store, but there just aren't local hardware stores, you know? Yep. So, no. Fairphone, the company that wants to get ethically responsible smartphones into the hands of consumers worldwide, has unveiled a third iteration of its modular device. Fairphone 3, launched under the tagline, The Phone That Dares To Be Fair... Uh, is available for pre-order now and boasts some pretty decent specs that put it on par with more well-established devices. The phone runs Android 9 and comes with Qualcomm's Snapdragon 632 chip, which has helped make solid dual cameras a reality in mid-tier devices. 
It also runs the same camera system as the Pixel 3a XL, boasts 64 gig of internal storage, expandable with micro SD card, a fingerprint scanner, quick charge support and NFC, plus it crams in the ubiquitous 3.5mm headphone jack that many fear is not long for this earth. In a bid to cut down on e-waste, it doesn't come with any accessories, cables or earphones and such, but who doesn't already have a drawer full of those kicking around? In short, it packs a pretty respectable punch with the added assurance that it's been built using as many conflict-free resources as possible and, thanks to its modular construction, is durable, repairable and upgradable. Fairphone is also the first smartphone company to integrate Fairtrade Gold into its supply chain. Do you remember when was it Google was going to have a modular mobile phone? You plug in whatever camera you want. You plug in whatever. Mm. Whatever happened to that? It wasn't. I don't know. There, there, there's a couple of different versions of that kept floating. The biggest problem I had with one of the ones that I saw got beta beta tested um, was the stability of the connections after a while. Yep. They're, they're becoming, um, you know. You, you're having issues getting proper connections there, or you pull it apart and dirt gets in the connector and you put new one in that you know damages stuff so that was the biggest problem uh, from what i understand was was causing the issues yeah so but um the new I, I, I honestly like if i'm gonna buy a phone it's gonna be that new um uh, what are those chinese they do the xiaomi or huawei the, the xiaomi's they do the new um, the the me notes and stuff like that, and they're just the specs on those things are absolutely insane for the and Good especially price. for the price. Like, yeah. you know, it's a three hundred dollar phone with a fifteen hundred dollar spec. It's it's just they're insane. Um, well, that's probably all I buy from now on. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you just when you look at the specs on them, you look at like they got you know dual dual fifteen megapixel cameras, and they've got you know eight eight amp hour. You know, eight, eight milliamp batteries, milliamp hour batteries, and they've got you know, eight, yeah, eight amp hour batteries. They've got um, you know, 128 gig ROM and 256 gig RAM, and it's just. Wasn't ridiculous. there an announcement when, recently that someone was going to start importing Xiaomi and selling in Australia? There is one guy uh, in Sydney or Melbourne. There's one guy that I know of who does it. Um, he's the official. Yeah, he's the official Australian supplier. Um, but you don't have to go through the, the advantage of going through him is he's already put the um, the localized version of Android on. If you go by direct from um, by direct from China, it's got the international version, which means it's set to Chinese by default. Yep. So it's a bit harder to initially set your phone up. But other than that, they're, they're exactly the same bit of hardware. Yeah. Uh, they've all got multi frequency radios and. Um, for all the, to cover all the spectrums of all the different sims, so you can put basically any one sim card and it'll work at full capacity. I um, mean, put dual, they run dual sims anyway. Um, and a lot of the new ones even have digital TV and digital radio built in. Oh, nice! Yeah, Why so don't more have cool. that? <laughs> yeah, um, just quickly, too, something I was just sort of touched on talking about profits, about Bunnings making money since the introduction of the um, the plastic bag ban. Well, the free plastic one, single use plastic bag, band, or whatever the hell you want to call it in Queensland. Um, Woolworths profits jumped uh, 12.5% to $71 million gross profit. Yeah. So that's because now you're paying for the bags that they're supplying rather than them paying for the bags. Supplying. And the total uh, figure of the um, waste that they supposedly were gen that we were supposedly generating and causing pollution. Um, has been negated by 0.03 percent. Ah. So congratulations! You've just given Coles and Woolies 12.5 percent profit boost, and um, they're, yep. they're going to, you know, not return the favour. They'll be happy with that. They still can't give farmers more than a dollar a litre for milk. Yeah, well, they upped the price of it and kept the profit. Said, thanks, farmers. That was a great profit yeah, for us. Yeah, that's it. Thanks we're for doing all happy. the hard work for us. <laughs> um. National Security Marine National Security Concerns threaten US China undersea cable. Um, so <clears throat> basically um, they're looking at putting a new undersea cable well there's, there's a couple going in, but 
One currently trying to go in from Hong Kong to LA. Uh, been backed by Google, Facebook, and a Chinese partner. Um, but the US officials, the US um, anti terrorist group, or whatever they are, um, has basically said, no, we don't want it. Um, we think it's a security risk. Hmm. Um, I'm not really sure if they understand the concept of the internet or optic fiber. <laughs> Um, they're really not sort of using, <laughs> they've already got undersea cables from sort of Hong Kong to America. They're just putting another one in to increase sort of throughput. Um, Sad so you better not do it. Yeah, you know, it's not like there's not 99% of the world's traffic being carried by undersea cables. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't, they, they don't haven't given a reason. They basically just said um, they the, wanna... the Department of Justice has, has been allowing it for security concerns. There you go. Um, Screw you guys. So I, I, don't, I don't really, you know, I don't, what is it suspiciously round? Is it like a 14 foot round cable that you can walk through the middle of it? I mean, that I, I would understand. You know, that'd be a little bit suspicious. You might smuggle people in. <laughs> <laughs> Or out. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Yet another case of America being on the ball. <laughs> and uh, Wi-Fi 6, the consumer-friendly new name for the tech standard actually called 802.11ax, won't just boost data transfer speeds, though it'll do that by a factor of three or so. It'll also reach into corners of our house farther away from network gear, better handle the crush of people at airports and stadiums, and sidestep interference from your neighbour's noisy network. On your phone or laptop, it should save your battery life too. No wonder wireless chip designer Qualcomm is betting big on Wi-Fi 6. The company on Tuesday showed off a quartet of processors that'll bring Wi-Fi 6 to a new range of network equipment, and a number of partnerships designed to telegraph its clout with the technology. Wi-Fi is ubiquitous and widely accepted, said Rahul Patel, leader of Qualcomm's Wi-Fi chip division, in an exclusive interview ahead of their Wi-Fi event. But with more devices in our houses and activities like gaming and streaming video putting new demands on networks, there's network traffic jam. Cord cutting is real. What is typically one TV in the average home is now five or six different screens. There's a tremendous amount of content sourced through the home that wasn't before. There's a congestion problem. One of Wi-Fi 6's biggest advances is OFDMA, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access. If you must know, an efficiency boosting pro technology purloin from mobile networks. Another is MU MIMO, short for multi-user, multiple input, multiple output. And there's 1024 QAM and quadrature amplitude modulation, which bumps up data rates by 30%. Sounds interesting. Now we've got to update all our stuff. <clears throat> Something weird about their statements because... They're saying that it's going to operate faster, which means it's going to be a higher frequency in the spectrum. Yet they're saying it's going to have better data transmission, which means that they're going to have to be pumping a huge amount of power in behind it because the higher in the frequency you go, the less distance it travels. And it, won't, it goes and less the, through walls and stuff. Yeah, and the more but prone to supposed to go further. So, <clears throat> hey? But this is supposed to go further with a higher frequency. But it doesn't make that's that's count that's count that doesn't work like that. But, no. <laughs> the, but the funny thing is, currently Wi-Fi six will connect to your current two point four and five gigahertz frequency. Other frequencies will be unlocked in the future. So, at the moment, the only thing I can think of is they're using like a dual band technology, um, oh. and they're using like say double, like two frequencies and sending and receiving, into like um, alternating packets. Yeah. Um, because you can't have the same frequency or higher with the same power transmission and get a better range. It just that's just not how how frequencies work. I like the way um, you say the frequency is going to be unlocked in the future. It's like playing an EA game. Well, if you want yeah. to unlock the frequencies, you've got to pay an extra two dollars a month or something. But I want to know who these people are who are having bandwidth problems because I've got multiple tablets and phones, a couple of laptops. TV, the Foxtel, Media Center, a heap of other stuff. And I'm not even using my 5G. I'm on my 2.4. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm on. And I don't have just about everything. It does most of the house, but I do have Wi-Fi dropouts. I don't think it's due to congestion. I think maybe there's something with my router, even though I put on uh, um, third-party firmware and everything, which is supposed to be much better. Still, every now and then things will just drop off for no reason, and then come back five minutes later, all fine. Oh yeah, there's that. I mean, that's that's unrelated. But the thing is, I don't how, I don't know how people are experiencing bottlenecking with current Wi-Fi. I, I don't experience bottlenecking on two point four, and I've got more devices than the average consumer would have. Maybe they got twenty people in their family. Well, that's what <laughs> I'm thinking. Like, well, they're just putting one internet connection in a you know in a hostel or something. They're running because a, the thing um, is Bitcoin node. <laughs> In their house. The, the, the thing is, though, you're going to run into bottlenecking with the internet because 5G data transmission is faster than what your internet's going to be. So if you've got five devices on 5G, you're not going to have internet because you don't have an internet, not because you don't have 5G. So what's the point of having this Wi-Fi? So unless, you, unless you're transferring files from computer to computer over Wi-Fi, yeah. you're not going to see any benefit from it. You're not going to have day-to-day increase in productivity or increase in bandwidth because you're still you're still hard limited at your internet connection but you've got to have a reason to upgrade your equipment and pay more money for new things don't you understand we've run out of uh, ideas i know it's the whole thing with the whole 5g debacle I, i'm not going to get it for several reasons but one of the primary reasons is you're not going to have the signal strength and they've admitted they've got to install multiple towers they've got to install something like um 16 towers to every one current tower because the, the the data transmission is such a short distance on the 5g yep um and like there's absolutely nothing on my phone that i need to download at 500 meg a second no <laughs> yeah I, I don't i don't understand why <clears throat> it just doesn't make any sense to me why i mean i know it's marketing i know they're trying to sell the next hotness but like seriously the problem is people just go away. Well, people don't bother to think for themselves really. these days. They just go, oh, look at all that's new. I must, I have to have it. The new shiny. So, yeah, pretty much. It's just, when you actually sit down and look at it and think about it from a logical standpoint, it, it's pointless. It doesn't, it doesn't help you at all. Yeah. Um, it's going to make your life difficult now because you're going to have more issues with phone dropouts and, connectivity issues because you're not going to have anywhere near the range they had previously and 4g is no doesn't have the signal capacity that 3g does and 3g doesn't travel as far as 2g and <laughs> 2g doesn't travel as far as as analog cdma, used to. CDMA and analog they were, they were you know the towers used to be on whatever they were 150 watts or something on cdma and they could go halfway across the country yeah <laughs> you know you just I don't know. It's just just because it's new doesn't mean it's good. Is yeah. what I'm saying. Any more stories for you? That's it for me. Ah, uh, look, there's a lot of really random stuff. If you actually scroll through the stories and look, it's just. Well, I was, well, it was on my Facebook feed today. Um, I probably can't find it now, but there's a, a manufacturing plant. Um, where they were mostly robots, and there was one one guy is doing something there and one of the machines went crazy and impaled him with 10 six foot steel spikes oh <laughs> um you know like it just has been doing its job quite happily and then just went no nah, i don't like you anymore. <laughs> just, you um, robot hater you it was just like what, what, didn't, but the way the story was written um they didn't give any information. They didn't say how or why. Yeah, here we go. Factory robot impales man with steel spikes after malfunction. A Chinese factory worker survived being skewered with 10 metal spikes on a robot malfunction. But that's as much information as you get. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know a little bit more of that story. <laughs> that's all you, know, you get. How, how many safeguards were bypassed and why was somebody going near a ro- malfunctioning robot in the first place? That's where the off switch um, is, man. The 49-year-old named Mr. Zhao was working in the night shift in a porcelain factory in Hunan province when he was struck by a falling when he was struck by a falling robotic arm 
The accident resulted in him being impaled with foot-long, half-inch thick metal rods. Stupid auto play, shut up. Um, he was first taken to like hospital before he was transferred to Central South uh, Six steel rods fixed on a steel plate, pierced his right shoulder and chest and four perforated elsewhere in his body. During the operation, doctors found that one of the rods missed an artery by 0.1 mil. The rod also prevented doctors from carrying out x-rays before the operation. <laughs> There's actually a photo of it. There's a oh. photo of it there, and basically, they're like that round. <clears throat> and there's like one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. Like, wow. <laughs> That's nasty. It's just insane. So, but, um, yeah, there's no information on what happened to the, Like, it's all this, you know, about this guy. And then they go and say how another. Yeah, they don't say anything about the robot. All they say is the robot malfunctioned and they hit by a falling arm. Well,. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know a bit more. I'd like to know why. There's a whole lot of things. I'd, there's a whole lot of questions in there. I'd, to, you to don't have the security the clearance for that, sir. <laughs> you can't handle the truth. Everything is wonderful in China. Don't worry about Everything it. Everything is awesome. <laughs> I was reading uh, recently. Who wrote, who wrote who wrote that song? I don't know. It was. Some famous musician. Awesome. I was surprised just too. Just be quiet for a minute while I looked it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is artist. Uh, well, that's not right. Everything's awesome. Wikipedia. Uh, written by Sean Patterson, Jolie and the Lonely Island. Yeah, Lonely Island wrote it. Those guys mm. are cool. <laughs> mm. I'm on a boat. I'm on a boat. Take a good hard look at the beep beep boat. Oh, is that them? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're oh, in. Oh, one of them was in Brooklyn Nine Nine, Andy. Yeah. <sighs> That's good though, yeah. to end the show on after your depressing story. <laughs> <laughs> Go uh, look up Lonely Island if you want a good laugh. They got Michael Bolton to sing about Jack Sparrow and stuff. It's hilarious. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I've seen that now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for listening to the Aussie Tech Heads show broadcast weekly. We can be found at facebook.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, twitter.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, and youtube.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, where you might be right now. Vote for us. Click the like, subscribe. What are you supposed to do? Make sure you bang that that notification smash thing. Smash that no, smash, <laughs> smash the bell and break the button or something. What are you supposed to do? <laughs> you can email us, Glenn at Will and Warlock at AussieTechHeads.com.au. You can hear Aussie Tech Heads on Aussie Tech Radio twenty four seven back to back play of some of the best tech related shows from around Australia and New Zealand. New shows added each Friday. Thanks for listening and uh, Glenn will be back with a more normal show that you'll want to listen to next week. See ya. <laughs> See ya.